Hello, we have a few people still joining the webinar, so we're going to give everybody about another minute to settle in, and then we'll get started. Hello everyone, um, my name is Brian DePaulo and I'm the Practice Director for our Assessment and Compliance Team at Accudata Systems and well, manage our PCI Qualified Security Assessor line of business. Uh, thanks for joining today and welcome to our presentation on Top 5 PCI Challenges. This was a list agreed upon ac across our entire QSA team uh, based on what we con continually see across many of our PCI engagements. The webinar today will be presented by two of our most senior QSA members with extensive experience across hundreds of engagements spanning various verticals. Tim Stills, who is our primary presenter, is a senior consultant at Accudata with his primary focus on PCI as well as technical assessment. Anton Abaya will also join us for the Q&A section and is another senior consultant on the team with a strong audit background um, uh, as well as, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, a strong audit background uh, with a focus around PCI and technical assessment as well as HIPAA compliance. Without further delay, again, I want to thank you for your time today and introduce Tim Stills to present five top PCI challenges. Hi, Brian, and uh, thanks, and certainly thanks to everyone for uh, uh, joining us on, on the call today as we uh, cover some of these different uh, topics that we see time and time again. Um, actually, if, uh, Brian, if you can go ahead and flip to the next slide for me. So real quickly, folks, so just to give a little bit of background on myself, uh, I've been involved with uh, cardholder data for, for a number of years. So uh, I have been uh, uh, involved with uh, Visa's cardholder information security program since around 2000 and uh, became a QSA uh, shortly after the council was formed in 2005-ish uh, is when I uh, became QSA. I've seen a lot of different environments. Uh, I've worked with retailers of uh, stores across the country. I've uh, worked in uh, finance and uh, banking and as well as uh, uh, some various uh, service providers. Um, also wanted to mention, too, uh, our assessment methodology. Uh, we're very practical in our approach. Uh, we try to always focus on the spirit of the controls. And I think what's probably most important is, is we're trying to give you some guidance. We're tell you how best to solve some of these controls in the least amount of time and, and certainly being very budget conscious. And lastly, um, We've uh, developed various tools to help streamline the data collection process. We, we know it's very overwhelming uh, with uh, what you've got to go through, and uh, so we've uh, put together some tools to help us gather this information. gives you a real-time perspective of uh, controls, their status, what's in place, what's not in place. So uh, that's something that we've developed over the years. Now, uh, these five scenarios uh, that we've picked here, we see them continuously and, uh, and can be very challenging for customers. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give you a high-level perspective of, of what those challenges are, and then as well as give you some use case examples of where we've seen how customers have, have solved some of these. Um, and first and foremost is uh, PCI scope. So this is certainly one of the, the, the major uh, categories in terms of uh, uh, establishing the ground rules for the engagement. And this is at the top here. We've got an excerpt from the DSS. 
basically iterating, right, that uh, the scope is a cardholder data environment, wherever cardholder data is, and anything that's connected to it. And so we refer to those as like uh, side scope systems, these ancillary systems that support that environment, such as uh, antivirus and uh, 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 for authentication, event logging, and things of that nature. Now, the challenge here, right, is uh, the need for segmentation. So if you don't have segmentation and isolation, it's going to drag your whole environment into scope. And so it's going to uh, make it even more challenging um, uh, as it is. Now, in this particular case here, we had a, a clothing retail chain. So they had uh, locations um, across the country, so uh, multiple stores and multiple lanes per, per location. And their issue was, was they needed to meet compliance in the shortest amount of time and, and as well as address multiple gaps. And so, unfortunately, uh, the registers uh, had um, – uh, the need to install antivirus on them certainly needed to do some patching and things of that nature. And so the solution here was, was to put into place a point-to-point -point encryption uh, solution. So if you've, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have come across this or have seen this, but basically what it is is you swap out your pin pad, your terminal, and at the point of interaction when a customer swipes, uh, basically the data is encrypted at that point. The merchant, uh, they didn't have any access to the encryption, decryption keys, so they don't have access to the cardholder data. And now it's traversing their environment uh, is encrypted data. And so basically, it uh, excluded their environment. It was no longer in scope. So it helped reduce that footprint and minimize uh, the, the scope uh, dramatically. Now, the challenge also for us as the auditor was that the proposed solution, uh, the pin pads, uh, were not on the approved list. So the council has an approved list of P2P solution providers, and if you use one of those, you get to fill out a very simplified questionnaire. And in this case here, the acquiring bank, uh, we went back to them. They were fine with this proposed uh, P2P pin pad because they'd already had about, as they had said, about 15 million of these deployed across the country. So they were fine with it. And so what we ended up having to do was we still had to fill out the complete report on compliance. So it was the level one assessment. But now what had happened was a lot of the controls were marked as not applicable uh, since the cardholder data didn't exist. And so it, it, uh, it reduced the effort uh, but, uh, and uh, helped streamline that, uh, that process. So moving on, uh, the next uh, category uh, coming up, vulnerability management. So vulnerability management applies to the whole environment. So we can't do any sampling here. Everything is applicable. And, uh, and there certainly is the need to um, – uh, scan all systems that are in scope, those side scope systems we were talking about. And the challenge right here is, is that we see a lot of times environments might be neglected or, or worse yet, there's this fear factor, right, that we don't want to apply patches because maybe uh, we're going to break systems and these things get identified in the, the uh, scan process. And in this particular use case here, we had a customer that had multiple call centers. But now their challenge was, was that these, call, uh, these workstations at the call centers were running legacy operating systems. And so um, they were going to be challenged with having to do a complete forklift upgrade. Obviously, limited IT budget, as most of you know, right? So, so uh, without, with this uh, outdated OS, uh, what we, we came up here with was uh, this endpoint solution that would uh, provide application whitelisting, uh, host-based firewalling. And so it gave us these granular controls of the environment and helped us lock it down. And then as well as we were able to raise the bar. So we went above and beyond with the host-based monitoring. So collectively, we felt that uh, putting an end to this endpoint security solution helped achieve like the spirit of the controls that locked down that environment for the call centers. And we felt confident with that and we were able to move forward. So moving on here, uh, another category, right? So one of the other items that we see, patch manager, right? So similar to what we just talked about. Uh, applies to the whole card or the data environment, all those ancillary side scope systems that are uh, uh, connected to it. Again, no sampling, right? So it applies to everything. Everything needs to be maintained. Key challenge here, right, multi-platform environment. So you've got Linux and, and Windows. You know, that uh, increases the challenge of it. And as well as any network devices, right? So we look at and see, right, where there's patches that need to be applied to, uh, you know, Cisco routers and, 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 and the network appliances itself, right? And, and also, too, another key challenge being that uh, uh, maybe patches are no longer are available, right? We've seen this time again where, uh, unfortunately, customers have, you know, some old legacy systems and they can't be patched. So in this particular customer's case, this use case here, 
they had a healthcare organization, right? So they uh, they had uh, multiple workstations within given buildings, and let alone across multiple campuses. So a very distributed environment. Uh, the need to apply patches across there again, install antivirus, uh, and, and just get on top of that environment. And so we kind of collaborated with them, and, and the solution here was was to come up with uh, the deployment of um, uh, Weiss uh, ThinkLine devices. Right? So they replaced their workstations, all those locations, and put these uh, ThinkLines in place. And so what was nice about this was was that the the workstations were doing minimal functionality. They were accessing some in-house applications for payment processing and customer data entry. So that was really it. So uh, they were able to minimize uh, what they needed to do from a, a patch management uh, application deployment perspective and move towards these uh, WISE uh, Think Lines. And you can get them in different flavors. So we have customers that have them both in Windows and, and as well as uh, uh, Linux-based as well. So the next category, the logging and monitoring, um, very challenging. Right? If you've looked at Section 10, you know there's a lot of detailed controls there, a lot of requirements that you, you need to handle. And uh, certainly what uh, is challenging for most customers is you get it's overwhelming with the amount of data that you get from all these systems and devices. Again, applies to that CDE and all those side scope systems. And so there's the need to gather this data. Sometimes we see customers, they don't have a, a centralized data collector. There's uh, islands of data that are out there. Uh, and so that's also a, a challenge. And then more importantly, uh, the need to do daily security re uh, event review, right? So we see, especially within a retailer environment, we know that uh, uh, it's a thin staff. It's difficult to stay on top of that and as well as, quite frankly, maintaining the stores because we, we know it's important for you to be able to handle uh, the, the processing. And so in this case here, right, retailer with uh, several hundred stores across the country, 10 lanes per store, so they had like 10 registers that, up to that many. The need to be able to, in this case, collect data from all these locations, normalize it, make sense of it, and then on top of that, be able to do daily log reviews. And uh, so combined with the, the limited resources, the overwhelming amount of data, uh, uh, the suggestion here and what they went with, and we see several customers do this here now, is where we get this where they outsource it. So they'll outsource to a security information and event management solution provider. And I really, really like this here because what it does is you literally flip a switch overnight where that you can achieve compliance in quite a few uh, control uh, areas. And so what happens is when you go to an outsourced log management solution provider, They'll put an appliance on site at your location, and now you pipe all your log data from all your devices to that device, and it will normalize it, and it will send it uh, upstream to the uh, event log collecting company that uh, will now, they, they're going to maintain the storage of the data for you. So now you've got your retention requirements met, and as well as, and most importantly, they've got 24-7 monitoring. So now you're not getting overrun by alerts. You've got somebody else that's looking at this, making sense of it, and then alerting you when it's important. We see a lot of times where customers, they may be getting alerts. I, I have a customer, they get daily email alerts, and it gets to the point where it's just background noise because there's just so much overwhelming information that hits them. So it's a very clean solution, I think, um, and, and it helps uh, offload quite a bit of effort. So last but not least, we've got uh, uh, system hardening. So uh, it, again, applies to that cartilage data environment, applies to the side scope systems. And what we see here, like if you look at the Section 2 requirements, um, the, 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 the main theme here is, is you've got to run the bare minimum, right? So we're, we don't have excessive services, no default passwords, and, and more importantly, we disable support for insecure services. And so uh, it's just a, the need to lock down the environment. Now, for this particular use case, we have a, a service provider. And uh, it was just a mashup of an environment. They had excessive services running, ad hoc deployment process. And so when you look across the environment, uh, you saw just a, a wide variety of available services, in most cases not even really needed. And so what we did is we came in and we said, look, let's get a, let's establish a baseline. The solution here is let's, let's look at the CIS benchmarks and the NIST hardening documentation. And certainly, the, if you've looked at the CIS benchmark documentation, it's pretty extensive. A lot of a lot of items in there, so you need to tailor that to your environment. And, and uh, but nonetheless, though, that's a good starting point. 
And so what we did was we said, okay, let's get this baseline build done, and that becomes our gold image. And then on top of that, let's make sure that the hardening standard has a process such that that, that image gets routinely updated with new patches as they come out. And then as well as that, what we did was this, this, that was like a review and approval process. So no more ad hoc deployments. Let's get something where we've got a, a board, right? You, I know a lot of you already do this, but you have a weekly meeting, you review, and then you approve what needs to get deployed. And then lastly, uh, we took advantage of what you already have, right? You have a bony management tool you already use to address other control requirements. So in this case, the idea was, hey, let's go in and do authenticated scans. That way there you can do configuration management and validation. So that way there you kind of come full circle and make sure what's already out there is in line with what the, the baseline standards are and, uh, and you're also validating, right? Things are getting updated appropriately. So in summary, we've got these five categories, right? And there's a lot of overlap, certainly between vulnerability management, patch management, system hardening, you see that. But at the top, right, PCI scope, that, that's, that's everything. And so that's where it all starts. And if you can get your arms around the scope, you minimize the effort in these other categories. And, and certainly it'll make it a lot easier for you in terms of you've got to shore up your environment, makes it a lot easier on us from uh, an auditor's perspective when we have to come in and assess an environment. So uh, uh, that will certainly minimize the challenges. So anyways, uh, that's basically it. These are the five categories that we see time and again, and uh, you know, collectively, if you can address these areas here, it will certainly make the whole process much easier. And uh, I think we've got some questions that were coming in, and uh, uh, with all that said, Brian, I'll hand it back to you. Sure, sure. So, so thank you, Tim. So uh, your review was very insightful. It's very consistent with, with what we've seen as a QSA company since 2007. Um, really, again, just stressing on the on the scope side, that is something that we see consistently, and it's so important that scope be identified and locked down as as quickly as possible through the process, and that will enable you to be more successful through through kind of your compliance journey. So at this time, though, we will begin our Q and A session with both Tim and Anton. Uh, during the registration process, we received a number of questions, which we'll review at this time. But if you have additional questions, and I know some of you joined a little bit later, um, if you have questions, please um, enter them into your Q&A window, which should be at the left side of your screen when you logged onto the webinar. Um, so, so feel free to be submitting those actually as we speak, and, and we'll try to get to uh, as many as we can. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, the first question I'm going to, going to direct to Anton. Um, could you provide any PCI concerns specific to Wi-Fi or wire, wireless point of sales? Sure, Brian, and thank you for that question. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and um, well, with regard to wireless uh, or Wi-Fi, uh, I think what we find um, to be the, the biggest challenge related to that is when you have an organization that has a wireless implementation across you know, a large, uh, um, you know, a large environment, you know, multi, you know, hundreds of stores, many, many buildings, many floors in that building, right? So there's a lot of wireless networks and devices access points that are, that are brought into the scope of PCI. Now, uh, the challenge usually in all of that is, is usually when, when organizations have, uh, I would even say early adopters of wireless, um, in the sense that they're, they may be using kind of dated technology. You know, the firmwares can't be uh, brought up to date. Maybe it's not even supported by the, by the vendor or manufacturer anymore. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, the, the centralized management features, uh, hmm. uh, are, are not fully there, right? So, um, you know, in, in, in and what, what we see a lot is that uh, the customers who do decide to bring wireless into the scope of PCI compliance, the ones that are the most successful, are the ones that have a modernized enterprise class solution, you know, with centrally managed, um, you know, um, uh, that are centrally managed, you know, that can be easily updated in firmware and made to comply with the PCI DSS requirements for wireless. Now, that's not always obviously the case. And I actually have a customer right now who, who kind of went through that. And uh, it was a large hospital system where they had their wireless in scope. You know, they had these workstation on wheels that they were pushing around, you know, um, in, say, say in the emergency room, or they had tablets used at various pharmacies that they, that they owned and, and, and managed, right? And the wireless infrastructure was obviously in scope for them, but the challenge was they couldn't get it PCI compliant because it, they were an early adopter and it was dated technology. 
Um, so the way we went around that uh, was to actually be creative with, with, uh, with the security uh, controls that we developed with them. Uh, and what we actually did was we moved network isolation all the way down to the workstations themselves, say the workstations on wheels. And what I mean by that is we deployed with them, um, you know, centrally managed host-based firewalls uh, that would isolate those, those systems, those workstations immediately on any Wi-Fi network. Um, another thing that we did was we validated uh, and ensured that their point of sale uh, applications or processes uh, on those workstations were always transmitting cartel data um, you know, encrypted, right? Uh, and, and by doing these two things, what we basically did was we treated the wireless network as a public network. Even though it was their wireless network, we just treated it as a, as a public network, right? Um, and when we moved all of those security controls closer to the workstation, we've effectively, um, you know, kind of locked down that system. So hypothetically, even if that workstation were to be moved to, say, Starbucks, you know, wireless uh, access point or wireless network, it would still remain PCI compliant. Obviously, that was not allowed by security policy, um, but um, I'm just driving a point home that it was still going to be PCI compliant, no matter what Wi-Fi network they connected to. All right. Well, th thank you, Anton. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question, and this one I will point back to uh, Tim. Uh, how does deployment of chip and pin chip and pin impact my organization's compliance requirements? Uh, sure, Brian. So uh, uh, deployment of the chip and pin uh, um, terminals, Visa had noted like uh, a couple of years back that uh, you know for for merchants that had up to set or seventy five percent or more of their transactions going through a chip and pin terminal they'd actually be allowed to skip their annual PCI compliance requirements. This is assuming that they've already been PCI compliant. So that's the advantage uh, so far in that if you certainly do that from a compliance perspective, that you can forego that, but at least from a visa perspective. Uh, so that's what we've heard. Now, unfortunately, it sounds like, though, we've come across this. Another consultant had talked about this the other day, that it interacted with uh, their bank uh, or a merchant's bank, and uh, the bank hadn't been aware of that capability, but it's out there. This came out a while back. So, uh, so yes, so if you can have over 75% of your uh, visa-based transactions, at least from visa's perspective, you can skip the uh, compliance. Uh, thank you, Tim. And, and I think one of the key things, too, is just always remembering uh, in those scenarios, so Visa does publish a, a number of these things, and sometimes we're surprised when the acquiring bank uh, will interface with the acquiring bank, and, and they don't necessarily know all of these communications from Visa. So, that, so it's definitely key uh, uh, to, since the acquiring bank is where you hold your, or who holds your merchant account, you definitely want to verify um, any of those uh, uh, those conclusions around uh, compliance or those 75% rule and so on. Um, with that said, though, uh, moving on to the next question, um, so I'm going to uh, jump back to Anton. Um, uh, let's do, is, uh, is my voice system in scope of PCI requirements for my call center that accepts credit cards by phone? Thanks, Brian. That's a very good question. We get that asked uh, pretty frequently nowadays. Um, so the answer is that the scope of PCI always applies to anywhere cardholder data is stored, processed, or transmitted. Um, in, the, in the case of voice system, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to voice over IP. Um, there are risks that have been identified with that kind of technology. Um, and the, the guidance from the PCI Council has been that uh, it needs, it, that the voice infrastructure sh should be considered in scope of PCI if there is cardholder data traversing that environment. Um, our customers have either brought that environment into scope um, if they could, right? Uh, some of them will enable encryption, for example. Um, uh, on their voice over IP uh, network, um, and uh, while others will change business processes so that they either limit the number of voice over IP phones that are brought into scope, maybe assigning it to a specific department that can accept credit cards, um, or you know maybe implementing an IVR type of technology, interactive voice um, 
uh, response system that can take credit cards um, on behalf of, say, a call center uh, so that, you know, your call center employees don't have to take it themselves over the voice over IP network. So, yes, the, the answer is yes, it is in scope. Uh, it can be easily addressed. There are various ways to get there, and it's just a matter of identifying which works best for your organization. All right. Th thank you, Anton. Um, so, Tim, I'm going to flip back to you again. Um, uh, what should a merchant do if cardholder data is accidentally received via an uninten unintended channel? Mm, okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, this scenario usually pops up where someone previously may have been um, uh, accepting uh, cardholder data via email. So a lot of times uh, when we've seen this, at least, is when customers have been emailing in their uh, payment information. And so then now all of a sudden that merchant has gone through this compliance process and they've you know, determined, hey, this isn't a viable acceptance channel. And so what will happen is, is that customers will continue to email their cardholder data in like that. And so normally what we do is we just say, hey, look, just uh, you know, have a general response that goes back out to uh, remind or iterate to those customers you know, that you no longer accept uh, credit card data uh, and payment data through that uh, channel like email and then as well as just delete it from the uh, email server so you know uh, if you do that process and you, you're reinforcing it uh, we're fine with that and and, uh, and I think there's even some verbiage from the council that iterate that you know as long as you go through and you delete it you're not necessarily dragging that exchange server into scope and that's a that seems like that works it's a pretty solid solution and you just keep iterating and eventually those customers will get it and they'll quit uh, using that payment channel thank you Tim um, let's see I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to let you off the hook yet I'm going to I'm going to leave you on Tim for this one but this this question's come in it looks like several times um, so um, it's actually it's been asked a couple different ways, so I'll, I'll kind of summarize this and, and present it to you, Tim. What do you think will be included in the next uh, version of the PCI DSS version 3.2, and uh, will 3.2 require multi-factor authentication for administrators? Okay. That was one of the specific questions. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So, uh, so 3.2, uh, well, for starters, so it's already been announced that the 3.1 version is considered to be relatively mature. So. The 3.2 version is just going to be some minor clarifications and updates. And so one key item, is, is, as a lot of you have seen, right, they've changed the date and the requirement date for uh, when you need to eradicate uh, support for SSL TLS 1.0. So that's a key item. They're going to make sure now that it reflects the latest requirements. I think it's like June of 2018. So that will get pushed out. And then in terms of the multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, they're not really clear on this, and so until we see the actual document, we'll know. But I think it's safe to say what's going to happen here is that um, as you admin those systems, those internal systems, for, well, from an internal perspective, the CDE uh, systems, uh, you're going to need to use probably multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication. And so previously the requirement was if you were remoted into an environment, you had to 2FA in, but... Uh, uh, now it looks like we can probably expect that this will be a requirement from an internal perspective. So no doubt we'll be, we'll be challenging for some customers, and so I think we'll, we'll see once they release that. We'll look at the verbiage and we'll see if we can come up with some solid uh, solutions that help streamline that implementation process for the customers. Yeah, no, and, and I believe, uh, so the 3.2 obviously has been announced, but it has not been released, so uh, uh, we will learn more as we see the specific details. And what we can definitely expect from the council, which we've seen before, is there will be a, 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 a roadmap or a timeline to bring some of these new controls into place, so, so it won't turn on immediately or be expected to be in place immediately, but they will provide a specific timeline, so uh, we can expect that. So moving on uh, to the next question, we're getting a, a lot of good questions. I'm going to, uh, sticking on the same, same, same theme of versions, one of the questions that was asked, and I'll, I'll point this back to Anton, um, uh, what are the changes in the, in the DSS between 3.0 and 3.1 now that 3.1 is, is required? 3.1 was actually a very interesting um, release from the PCI Council. It was, uh, it was released almost immediately um, after a lot of the uh, vulnerabilities came out regarding SSL and, uh, and early versions of TLS. You probably would have heard of some of them, Beast, Poodle, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and the PCI Council basically said, you know, SSL and early versions of TLS were uh, no longer to be used uh, within the organization, effective immediately, right? Um, and, and it came out right away uh, because they were they were trying to address the, the immediate risk 
that occurred uh, related, related to those to SSL and TLS. Now, a short while later, they actually backed off on that um, on that uh, on that on the on the deadlines of effective immediately, uh, because there was a lot of pushback from the industry. Um, there were a lot of organizations that couldn't move there immediate, uh, that quickly enough. And, um, you know, it turns out that maybe the risk wasn't fully there, uh, sure. wasn't that critical. Um, so we expect so the, the, that, that, you know, the, they backed off on that effective immediately response for version version for SSL and, and T, earlier versions of TLS. And that's going to be reflected in actually uh, the three, 3.2 release. Um, and, and some of those kind of sunset deadlines will be reflected there as well. Thank you, Anton. That was a good response. Um, I've uh, let's see. We'll jump to a, a different question. I guess I'll point this one back to Tim. Um, uh, a question came in. It's asking uh, when using an enterprise solution such as patching or logging solutions, do all those systems the solution access become in scope? No. Uh, I, it, we're, our focus is really on, and we always try to re remind folks of this, right? That we kind of connect it. The, where the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone mentality. So really, those uh, ancillary systems that might sit outside of that in-scope environment, they may support the in-scope systems. But you know, we recognize, right, that, for instance, AD will support other uh, systems uh, within the environment. So any of those other ancillary systems or users that may connect to that, we don't, we don't extend the scope to that. So we kind of delineate that. We go as far as whatever is connected to the in-scope environment and usually stop there. So we don't need to extend beyond that. So if you were to do that, I mean, it would be back to where we started with the whole environment would be in scope. But uh, that's usually been our approach and it's been pretty solid. Thanks, Tim. Um, um, let's see, moving on, we've got uh, – here, here's – sounds like a pretty good question. Let's, um, let's go back to Anton again. So um, people, uh, or I'm sorry, PCI is about people, process, and technology. Um, and and the, the top five challenges we presented today were very focused on various technologies. Um, uh, what are the top challenges from the people and process standpoint? That's a very good question. Um, I'm actually facing that problem right now for, for a very large merchant customer. Um, the, they, they have something like 15,000 people who, uh, total in the organization that are involved with credit cards at some point or another. Um, and I think the biggest challenge with people and processes is, um, when you have that large, that large number of people and, and in their case, they're actually in the process of trying to change the culture. They had a culture that, that permitted um, you know, emailing of credit cards for a very long time. Uh, and when, when it came, it became time to become PCI compliant, um, you know, with a QSA, that was one of the things we had to call out and say, Hey, this isn't actually allowed by the PCI council and the way you're doing it is, you know, insecure. Um, so right now, and they've, and, and certainly the organization has embraced that. They've acknowledged that, especially at the top. And uh, right now, they are in the midst of trying to change culture, right? Everybody's just habitually using email and have done so for, you know, the, the many years that they've been in business. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge. It's, it's, it's training, it's consistency uh, of, of the application of, you know, policies and procedures and, and making sure that the message um, uh, is, 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 is uh, embraced by uh, the people uh, within the organization. Thanks, Anton. Um, good, uh, um, good recap. I think I'm going to jump to the next question. So, I, I, actually, I'm going to take this question myself. The, the question is, are some QSAs more liberal, liberal than others? And um, uh, as, as, the, uh, as the director who manages this area, I, I think uh, I, I want to uh, address that real quickly. It, at the end of the day, there's the PCI Council. We've been a QSA uh, since 2007, and we've seen a lot of good QSAs, and we've seen a lot of other QSAs that, you know, are, are probably more liberal with, with how they interpret the, interpret the controls. Um, the PCI Council has, been, has put in place a QA program back around 2009, um, and that is a process to audit the QSAs and really to drive consistency among the QSA community. At the end of the day, we do realize as a QSA, you're in business. Uh, you, you have, you have a, a requirement to, to do whatever you do as a, as a business organization, and PCI compliance is just a, a, um, is something that uh, needs to be accomplished per your, your cardholder data requirements, but that's obviously not what you're in business to do. 
Um, with that said, we are required as a QSA to um, make sure the control, when we're doing an, a PCI on-site assessment that is being attested to by, by us as a QSA, we have to ensure that the intent of each control is met. And so the challenge there is so we absolutely don't you know PCI is very prescriptive and so we can go down the path of looking at that looking at those details but as long as the intent of the control is being met and we are comfortable with that and it, it is is uh, mitigating the risk of carnal data as as was intended then we can sign off on that control um, and really it's a, it's an interactive process we work with you but it, but in terms of the question of you know are more are some QSAs more liberal than others obviously the all QSAs are not consistent, and, and it, it varies depending on the organization. But at the end of the day, the, the council is trying to put things in place to ensure we are being consistent in how we interpret controls. Um, we are, uh, for example, being audited against those controls, so we want to make or audited against those uh, engagements we deliver. But, I mean, a good example I'll give you is just recently I had a co co uh, conversation with a customer where um, they had an environment, very small amount of cardholder data, um, but it wasn't fully compliant, um, and it really comes down to a business decision of really do we want to spend all this money to make this environment compliant, or the better solution may be to go back and discuss with your bank and get an exception, um, to, and, and maybe the idea is you're going to retire that, you know, move that cardholder function to something else, or get an exception just to allow that to proceed forward based on just the very small amount of, of um, volume and the risk being very low. But ultimately, the, the risk can't be accepted by the QSA and the risk can't be accepted by the organization. The risk has to be accepted by the acquiring bank in that case. So I will um, uh, I'll move on. It looks like we have a few more questions and then, then we'll get wrapped up. Um, the next question I'm going to point back to Anton. Um, uh, what type of service providers impact my PCI compliance, and how do I need to manage this as a merchant? Thanks, Brian. Uh, that's a, another good question, actually. So, um, again, as a reminder, so the scope of PCI applies to, you know, people, processes, and technologies that store, process, or transmit cartilage data. So, one of the key focuses for service providers is identifying, well, who are third-party entities to your organization that are directly in the flow of cardholder data and, um, you know, and, and what are they doing exactly for you uh, related to that. Uh, the, the other challenge I think I see with, with a lot of merchants is that they will forget about other service providers that can actually also affect the security of their cardholder data environment, but are not necessarily in the flow of cardholder data. So examples of that would be a firewall management um, uh, service provider, you know, IT managed services provider. You know, these are IT custodians or, you know, um, organizations that have, uh, you know, kind of always on access to your security controls or your technologies where cardholder data lives, breathes, right, or is flowing through. And where those uh, service providers can impact the security of your environment, um, we, we bring or we must bring those service providers in scope because we need to make sure that they are, you know, meeting the PCI DSS and meeting security requirements related to that. Uh, and if you look at very recent breaches um, that have occurred, it's a common, um, it's a common uh, occurrence that the attack comes from a service provider that's connected to your environment. Uh, so I think, you know, to be able to manage that as a merchant, identifying all your service providers, and most critically, identifying how they can impact the security of your environment is, 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 is key to success uh, when, when dealing with service providers. Thank you, Anthony. Um, well, it looks like we're going to have one last question, and then then we'll get wrapped up. Um, this question, I'll actually I'll, I'll send this back to you, uh, Anton, as well. Um, why is um, uh, why is SAQ AEP used for direct post, while SAQA is used for iframe or URL redirect? So, really, um, trying to understand the differences between those two SAQs. Sure, uh, it's a very good question. So, SAQA. Um, you know, was was originally meant for merchants with an e-commerce uh, uh, implementation that is completely outsourced, right? Um, SAQ AEP came up uh, came up, uh, I think maybe a couple years ago, where the council needed to find a way to address a very specific risk that they were seeing, where uh, merchants were partially outsourcing their uh, payment uh, process, their e-commerce payment processes. So AEP was developed 
exactly for what's called a direct post, where your website has, you know, kind of form fields for credit card numbers that was generated by your web servers, as opposed to being generated by uh, completely fully generated by a service provider. So for example, you know, you might have your payment checkout form on your e-commerce site. And instead of you generating the, the, the form, it's actually an iframe embedded into your uh, into your code, right? Or it, it, it is a full redirect, such as you know, full redirect to PayPal or something like that, to complete the payment process. So the SAQ AEP applies to the direct post scenario because, particularly because they've identified a lot of fraud that was occurring in those types of situations. Some of you might be thinking, well, you could do the same thing with the iframe or even the full redirect, an attacker can somehow get into that. And the council has addressed that by really just saying that they recognize that risk, it does occur, but it's much, much, much smaller um, compared to the direct post issue. Um, and, you know, I mean, really the reality is if you are uh, tackling this problem right now, which one do we, which, which direction do we take, an SAQ AEP or an SAQ A? Uh, I as a QSA will tell you that it'll be easier if you can get to the SAQ A scenario by deploying, you know, again, iframes or full redirects. Uh, because the SAQA has 17 PCI DSS requirements, and the SAQ AEP has 157 PCI DSS requirements. So, you know, it, it's obviously a no-brainer in that, in that sense. Um, but, you know, to each his own, I think, um, you know, there are challenges uh, for some organizations to move to an SAQ A scenario. Uh, but it's, it's something that is, is that we've seen done um, very frequently uh, because it does take out a lot of the PCI responsibility. Um, to, to go to, to an SAQA format. Thanks, Anton. That was a, a good, good recap. So at this point, this will conclude our Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, uh, so leveraging our QSA, QSA experience, I hope you found today's topic uh, valuable. Uh, additionally, where you have specific PCI needs within your organization, our team can help you, uh, help you through that process, including discovery, assessment, remediation, and attestation if that's applicable to your organization. But lastly, where you think of additional questions beyond this webinar um, or would like to have a meeting with our team, please uh, uh, reach out to us. We can be reached at, this, at our email address, askrqsa at accudatasystems.com. Um, and at the conclusion, again, all of this will be made available to you if you registered for the webinar. Again, thank you for your time today, and have a great day.